Today on the Matt Walsh Show, the jury in the Rittenhouse case gets it right while the media explodes in a blind rage. We'll talk about the fallout from the not guilty verdict today. And a man plows through a Christmas parade in Wisconsin, injuring dozens and killing many. Many aspects of this case make it inconvenient for the corporate media. We'll talk about those facts today. And Fauci officially recommends boosters for all people over 18. Plus, the Fight for 15 movement has now become the Fight for 25 movement. Who could have seen that coming? We'll talk about all that and much more today on the Matt Walsh Show. As an increasing number of companies fall all over themselves trying to appeal to the left, wouldn't it be nice to find one that supports your values? Well, I have one. You already know what I'm going to tell you. Charity Mobile. Charity Mobile is the pro-life phone company. They partner with you to automatically support the pro-life, pro-family charity of your choice with 5% of your monthly plan price, and they've sent millions of dollars to charities so far. Um, And they also offer a great service. New activations and eligible accounts get a free cell phone with free activation and free shipping. When you mention offer code Walsh, Plus, you get a free Christmas gift with every phone from Charity Mobile while supplies last. That's another thing you're not going to get from other companies is a Christmas gift. And they especially won't call it a Christmas gift like Charity Mobile does. Charity Mobile makes it easy to switch. You can keep your existing phone number, and you may even be able to keep your existing phone as well. If you need a new phone, no problem. They got you covered there, too. And they also have new flip phones with parental controls that allow you to disable mobile uh, data usage, text and picture messaging, and more, which is so important if you're a parent and you're going to get your kid a cell phone, make sure you get one of those kinds of phones so they can't go on the internet. Um, You get all of that from Charity Mobile while, again, helping to build a culture of life in America. So switch to Charity Mobile and support the causes you care about. Call them at 1-877-474-3662 or chat with them online at charitymobile.com and mention offer code Walsh. It's tempting to say that justice was done on Friday when the verdict in the Kyle Rittenhouse trial was returned and Kyle was found not guilty on all counts. It was certainly a just verdict, the right verdict, but we can't say that justice was done unless and until all of the people responsible for this political show trial are held accountable. The prosecutor should be disbarred. The media who smeared Kyle as a white supremacist serial killer should be sued into bankruptcy. Their lives should be ruined. They should suffer. We should want them to suffer for it because that's justice. And that still would not even the score. It wouldn't set everything right because they have taken something from Kyle Rittenhouse, that he can never get back. Namely, his entire normal life, the life he ought to have lived, is gone. He is free as he should be, but he'll never really be free from the slander and defamation. That's what makes slander and defamation so insidious. He'll have to walk around with a scarlet R racist on his head forever because that's the reality that the media has constructed for him. And this is why they should pay and pay dearly. It's not a no harm, no foul situation. They have done immense harm to Kyle Rittenhouse and done it on purpose with malice in their hearts. And they aren't done. After the verdict was right on Friday, the the demons in the corporate media convulsed and screamed and vomited like a scene straight out of The Exorcist. Watching MSNBC on Friday, as I did for a couple of hours, purely for the entertainment, I have expected to see someone's head do a like 360 degree turn. They were apoplectic in their demonic rage. And they were not prepared to surrender their narrative or back away from it even an inch. Many examples, of course, we could play for you. You've probably seen a lot of them, but we'll settle on just a couple. First, here's uh, one of the hobgoblins on MSNBC, Tiffany Cross, having a rather ghoulish temper tantrum. Watch. I find these people disgusting, Ellie. I'm disgusted at what I'm seeing. It's not just this trial, it's other trials, but this in particular, the fact that white supremacists roam the halls of Congress freely and celebrate this little murderous white supremacist and the fact that he gets to walk the streets freely, it lets you know these people have access to instituting uh, laws. They represent the legislative branch of this country. What are we to make of that? Welcome to the modern Republican Party. This is what these people want, and this is what a majority of white people vote for. Right? When I say that a majority of white people are in favor of this kind of violence, it is because a majority of white people consistently vote Republican. Consi- you know, since the passage of the Civil Rights Act, a majority of white people have voted Republican, right? So, like, this is the party that they're supporting. A majority of white people pick judges like Bruce Schrader, the judge in the Kyle Rittenhouse case. A majority of white people do not support policies that would unpack and unroll and reform this system of justice. This is what they want. Matt Gates is giving the white folks what they want. Look at it. Look at yourselves. It's gross. But until a majority of you stop voting for this, this will keep happening. I may have misheard it, but did he snort like a pig there? 
I don't know. It's, I mean, if it oinks like a pig, you know what they say. Little murderous white supremacist is what uh, Kyle Rittenhouse is called there. After the verdict, he was found not guilty of murder. And he's not a white supremacist. There was never any reason to think that he was a white supremacist. There's never been even one single slight shred of evidence that he's a white supremacist. He shot three white people in self-defense as a court of law just declared. By the way, a majority of white people are in favor of this kind of violence. I don't know where he's getting this from, but I'll tell you as one white person, yeah, you're damn right. I am in favor of violence in self-defense where you're killing a child rapist who's trying to kill you. I'm in favor of that violence all day, every day. But MSNBC will stick with the fantasy scenario it constructed early on. The people at MSNBC and across the corporate media and the American left, they arrived at a conclusion about the Rittenhouse case within three minutes of the last shot being fired, and they have not wavered from it, even the smallest bit since that initial moment. That's because the truth doesn't matter at all. We'll get back to that point in a moment. But first, here's another example, somehow uh, even more delusional. This is someone named Amber Ruffin, who has some kind of show on MSNBC or Peacock or whatever. Uh, Here she is. You guys, because I have my own show, I have a responsibility to say things that people need to know that aren't being said. It's a cool opportunity that I don't take lightly. There are very big, obvious truths that no one wants to say on TV, but I will. Now, just a few minutes before we started taping the show, Kyle Rittenhouse, the man accused of shooting three people during a Black Lives Matter protest, was declared not guilty on all charges. So, I can't believe I have to say this, but... It's not okay for a man to grab a rifle travel across state lines and shoot three people and then walk free. It's not okay for the judicial system to be blatantly and obviously stacked against people of color. It's not okay for there to be an entirely different set of rules for white people. State lines. I mean, I get really emotional about state lines also. You travel across state lines. In fact, I'm worried now after the Rittenhouse verdict, that this will set a precedent. And now people will feel entitled to just cross state lines whenever they want. I, I'm, I'm worried that, you know, slippery slope situation, that that next thing you know, we're going to have a whole uh, system of roads set up, like uh, like um, maybe we need like an interstate highway system they might build where people just cross state lines whenever they want. Uh, that's what I'm worried about. By the way, um, you know how Kyle Rittenhouse was accused of crocodile tears because he was uh, he was uh, he you know had he had an emotional breakdown while on trial to trying to save his life. Um, those were not crocodile tears. If you want to know what crocodile tears look like, which is what you just saw there, Amber Ruffin, that's what that's what fake crying looks like. And literally every single thing she said is wrong, every word, starting with the pretense that what she said there was somehow bold and brave and something that nobody else is willing to say. She simply repeated the same thing that everyone in corporate media is saying and has said a million times already, and yet pretends that this requires courage, that nobody's going to say this except the last seven million people you you heard say it. So I'll say it. No, courage and shamelessness are not the same, Amber, though I realize this distinction is often lost on the left. She also says that uh, he grabbed a rifle and crossed state lines and murdered people. None of that is true. We know that it's not true. The facts are incontrovertibly against her. But what does she care? As for the justice system being stacked against people of color, that seems an odd claim given that nobody involved in this case was a person of color. Black people have nothing to do with this case. I understand that black supremacists might struggle to understand that point, but it has nothing to do. This this was a case involving white people. Is it true that only white murder defendants get off on self-defense claims? Well, no. In fact, on the very same day on Friday, at almost the exact same time that Kyle Rittenhouse was acquitted of his murder charges on the basis of self-defense, a man down in Florida, Andrew Coffey, was also found not guilty of murder and attempted murder on the grounds of self-defense after shooting at a SWAT team that came into his house unannounced. That acquittal was again on the same day. Andrew Coffey is black. On the same day. He's not alone. Amy Swearer, a uh, legal fellow at Heritage, 
has a great thread on Twitter documenting many recent cases of black defendants being acquitted of murder charges on the grounds of self-defense. It happens all the time. It is very, very common. The media might not tell you about it, but it happens. There is simply no evidence at all, no reason to believe at all, that Kyle Rittenhouse would have been convicted if he was black. There is no evidence at all, no reason to believe at all, that self-defense laws disproportionately help white people. There is no data to back that up. None. In fact, the opposite is probably the case. The Daily Caller ran an analysis um, back in 2013 in Florida to see who benefits the most from the state's standard ground law. And they discovered that black people are disproportionate beneficiaries of that law. Okay, black person in Florida is more likely to be acquitted on self-defense than a white person. And there's plenty of reason to believe that this trend holds true across the nation. But that won't stop the narrative or even slow it down. Just as the left has not held itself back from anointing Joseph Rosenbaum and Anthony Huber martyrs for the case. Even as a court of law just effectively found them both to be attempted murderers. I mean, that's the, the implication here. If it was self-defense on Rittenhouse's side, then it was attempted murder on their side. And that's the most flattering thing on their resumes. Rosenbaum, as you know from the show, was a serial child rapist, a pedophile sodomite who anally raped young boys. Yet protesters took to the street after the verdict and chanted Rosenbaum's name. Listen to this. Say his name! Joseph Rosenbaum! 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 Joseph Rosenbaum. Joseph Rosenbaum. Say his name, Joseph Rosenbaum. That's almost as sickening as the tributes that have poured in from Hollywood. Actor Pedro Pascal tweeted, uh, Joseph Rosenbaum, 36, and Anthony Huber, 27, murdered August 25th, 2020. Rest in peace. Now, the best I can say about that statement is that it's a bit optimistic. Rosenbaum, a serial child rapist who died while trying to kill a teenage boy, is almost certainly burning in hell. You know, that say his name, Joseph Rosenbaum, I, we can imagine the legions in hell. That's what greeted uh, Rosenbaum as he was walking down the hallway. God's forgiveness, of course, knows no bounds. But considering his last moment on earth was spent trying to murder a teenager, it seems unlikely that he had any sort of last minute repentance or conversion. Meanwhile, Mark Ruff Ruffalo tweeted, quote, we come together to mourn the lives lost to the same racist system that devalues black lives and devalued the lives of Anthony and Jojo. Hashtag reimagine Kenosha. Yes, that's a major Hollywood actor using a cutesy pet name for a serial child rapist. Talk about saying the quiet part out loud. I mean, these Hollywood perverts are so used to hanging out with child molesters and rapists that they feel bonds of affection even with the rapist they've never met. Though perhaps I assume too much. For all I know, Rosenbaum and Ruffalo went to the same parties. Who knows? Either way, add Rosenbaum to the list of recent heroes and martyrs of the left. It's a list that includes George Floyd, a man who forced his way into a woman's home and robbed her at gunpoint. Jacob Blake, a violent felon and alleged rapist and woman abuser who assaulted police, brandished a knife, got shot while trying to steal a car and kidnap children. Rayshard Brooks, a felon who passed out drunk in a fast food drive through lane, then got himself shot while fighting with the cops and stealing their taser. Dante Wright, a wanted criminal who sexually assaulted a woman and robbed her at gunpoint. Now, now to this pantheon, this Mount Rushmore of deviants and demons, we can add Joseph Rosenbaum, child molester and rapist. These are the men that the left bids us to celebrate and admire. The absolute worst sorts of people human society has to offer. The dregs of humanity, the bottom of the barrel, these are meant to be our, our martyrs. So what's going on here? Between the celebration of Joseph Rosenbaum, all of the lies told about Kyle Rittenhouse, what we have to understand is that the left is not just building a narrative, though they are doing that. But more so, they're creating an entire new reality. Their ultimate goal is to construct an alternate universe. You know, I give a talk on college campuses called The War on Reality about the left's efforts to redefine life, marriage, and gender, and the title is not hyperbole. I mean, they have waged war on reality itself, truth itself. 
And as I argue in the talk, the three main pillars of this effort, the three primary modes of attack, are to redefine these fundamental elements of human civilization. Their battle plan has been such a success thus far that many people in our society today will look you in the eyes and flatly deny that any such thing as truth or objective reality exists. The upshot is that with something like the Rittenhouse verdict, it's fruitless to argue that the left's narrative isn't true or that it contradicts the facts. They know that and they don't care. Or I, sh I should say, contradicting the facts is the whole point. Telling a leftist that their claims about some event are untrue, it's like reading a sci-fi novel and objecting that none of that happened in real life. It's a fantasy. Well, yeah, that's the point. The only difference between the sci-fi novel and the claims made by the leftist is that the fictional reality in the book is supposed to be contained only in the book. For the leftist, we're all meant to live in his fictional reality. We're supposed to pretend that it's real. A world governed by self-identity and emotional whim, a reality that is malleable, which changes to accommodate political and ideological needs. That's the objective. That's what's at stake. And it's time we understand that. Now let's get to our five headlines. As we get into the holidays, you got to think about buying gifts. You're, we have Thanksgiving coming up, and we know how expensive food is. I mean, th I can't imagine putting together a Thanksgiving dinner, what that's going to cost us. Um, all that means is that you got to save money wherever you can, and that's why you need to get the Get Upside app. My listeners are making up to 25 cents for every gallon of gas every time they fill up. Just download the free Get Upside app in the App Store or Google Play right now. Use promo code Walsh and get a bonus 25 cents per gallon on your first fill up. That's up to 50 cents cash back. You don't have to pay full price of the pump. Um, you can get cash back using GetUpside. Just download the app for free and use promo code Walsh to get up to 50 cents a gallon cash back on your first tank, 25 cents a gallon thereafter. Some people who drive a lot are making two, $300 a month. I've talked to people making that kind of money. Um, and there's no catch. The cash back is added right to your account and it really is as easy as that. You can cash out anytime to your bank account, PayPal. You can even get uh, uh, gift cards and you know th that could be part of your Christmas gift to somebody. Just download the free Get Upside app and use promo code Walsh to get up to 50 cents a gallon cash back on your first tank. That's code Walsh. All right, so I want to jump right into this um, horrible, horrible case in Waukesha. I think I'm pronouncing that right. Uh, Waukesha in Wisconsin. And it just so happens that um, this was a, you know, this, this happened at a Christmas parade in Wisconsin. I think uh, maybe less than an hour away from Kenosha. Um, this was on Sunday and they were having their Christmas parade and a car, an SUV, uh, drove through the middle of the parade. And uh, as of the last time I checked before we uh, started filming, the, the death toll now is five with more than 40 people injured, many of them kids, because these were kids who were in the parade, you know, dancing and singing, all that kind of stuff. And this car just goes right through the parade and keeps on driving. Um, now, let me read this from the Post Millennial. And there's a lot of information we still don't have. I mean, this happened last night and there's information coming in. And so um, uh, of, of what I report right now, I'm not sure what of this will, will still be relevant by the time uh, you listen to this, but this is from the Post Millennial. It says, a suspect has been identified as in custody for the mass casualty incident in Waukesha, Wisconsin, when a red Ford Escape uh, plowed into a holiday parade. So far, five have been confirmed dead, more than 40 injured. According to court documents, 39-year-old Daryl Edward Brooks has been arrested as a suspect in the incident. Brooks is a career criminal with multiple priors and was released from jail two days prior to the incident after posting a $1,000 bail for three misdemeanors and two felonies. $1,000 bail. So you've got a career criminal, multiple convictions, charged with, uh, with um, five criminal counts, two of them felonies, and he had a $1,000 bail. He has a history of resisting arrest, obstruction, battery, statutory sexual seduction, strangulation, suffocation, property destruction, illegal firearm possession, bail jumping, domestic violence, drug-related charges, and is a registered sex offender. And they let him out on $1,000 bail. Again, one of his prior crimes is bail jumping. 
The driver of the red SUV plowed through a police line at high speed and into a parade of Christmas marchers on Sunday, impacting more than 20 adults and children in a graphic scene captured on the city's live stream and cell phones of bystanders. Uh, you can, I mean, I've seen some of the video of this. I, I don't recommend uh, watching it. I mean, as you can imagine, extremely disturbing. But there is, there's, so, so, there are some important details that you find when you watch these videos, and we'll get to that in a second. Now, a little bit more on Daryl Brooks, which the Post-Millennial reports, he's the person of interest. Um, in a rap video on his YouTube page, Brooks is seen dancing in front of a red Ford Escape, the same type of vehicle used in Sunday's fatal incident. Um, Wakesha, Wisconsin Police Chief Daniel Thompson confirmed in a press release following the tragedy that an officer who's been on the force for over six years opened fire on the vehicle and that a person of interest was in custody. Uh, Thompson em- emphasized that the investigation is, quote, very active. Okay, then we go over to uh, what the corporate media is saying. And what we're being told so far, and again, this could change, but initial reports, and uh, the media has been very, sh- very short to report this. And in fact, CNN on CNN.com on their, uh, on their website, they had a big headline announcing this. That as it stands right now, what they're telling us is that there, there was no particular motive in this crime. That he, in fact, was fleeing from another crime, and that's why he drove right through a parade. So here is the um, local uh, NBC affiliate. It says, Brooks has not formally been identified as a suspect by police and has not been charged with a crime. The motive behind the incident remains unclear. Earlier on Monday, a law enforcement official said investigators are examining whether the person of interest in this case may have been fleeing from a crime when he sped into the parade goers. The investigators were questioning a person in custody about that incident, which the official described as an altercation involving a knife. The official who cautioned that the investigation was still in the early stages and was continuing to develop could not discuss the investigation. So that's um, that's what we're being told. Yeah, the the headline on CNN says, suspect in parade tragedy may have been fleeing another scene. Okay. So a few things. Uh, And we should also mention that Daryl Brooks is a black man. Okay, and that's relevant because it might speak to why we can't necessarily trust what the media tells us. All right, we know Las Vegas. That that was a white guy in Las Vegas, but fifty over fifty people were shot and killed years ago, and to this day, we've never been told why he did it. Almost every other mass shooting, mass killing in recent memory, um, we've got a pretty good idea of the motive. They tell us like almost right away. Years later, with with uh, Las Vegas. They never told us the motive. I'm wondering if it'll be a similar thing with Wokesha. You know, I, I wouldn't be surprised if two years from now, people are saying, hey, remember that uh, thing that happened when the guy plowed through a parade and killed a bunch of children? Why, why, why did he do that? Whatever happened with that? I would not be surprised if the same thing happens here. Uh, because already... You know, the early narrative, what they're trying to convince us is that this was, I guess, basically unintentional and that he was trying to flee the scene of another crime. Now, in terms of of sentencing, it it really shouldn't make a difference because if this was intentional, he was trying to kill a bunch of people or if this was callous disregard for human life and he didn't care if he killed a bunch of people, either way, uh, it should be really it should be a death sentence. It should be an eye for an eye sentence where you strap him down on the road and then a parade of cars runs over him until he dies. That's what I believe in. Um, now, as it happens in Wisconsin, they don't have the death penalty anymore, as far as I know. But it should still be life in a cage, never leaving ever again, r- regardless of the motive, given how many people died. But even so, um, was this intentional? He was just trying to flee uh, the scene of another crime? I-, I don't believe that for a second. And I get very suspicious when I hear a motive like that proposed as a possibility and that there's really no motive because you can, you can see the video. It is very clear in the videos that he is intentionally targeting people. I mean, the car turns so that he hits more people. Now, if you're fleeing the scene of a crime, you're just trying to get away. And let's say you don't really care that much if you hit people, but you, you, your main motivation is you want to, you want to get away from, uh, from, from the cops. Well, for one thing, you'd probably go around the parade just for the sake of going faster. You go around it. 
But also, you would start honking your horn. You would try to steer around people. Again, if, even if you don't care about their lives, it's going to let you go faster if you don't hit anybody. So it just doesn't make any sense. He never honks his horn, never announces that he's coming, makes no attempt to go around anybody. He goes through multiple intersections and never turns. And yet we're being told that potentially he was just fleeing the scene of another crime. I don't believe it. I don't buy it. Now, what we know is that this person of interest is a black man. And um, there are indications, there are reports that he was at a minimum a BLM supporter. And he appears to have rap videos where he's got a lot of anti-white rhetoric and that sort of thing. So you have to wonder, did that have anything to do with this? Was he at all motivated? I mean, is it a coincidence that this happened only a few miles away from Kenosha a couple of days after the verdict? Is it just a coincidence that the verdict happens and then may, and then apparently a BLM supporter plows through a, um, a parade of mostly white people? Is, is, I mean, it could be. It could be. But... Um, I don't believe the initial narrative. I'll just tell you that. I personally don't believe it. It doesn't make any sense. It does not pass the common sense smell test. And the problem is, though, let's just say that there is some element of, and it could be a combination of these things. I mean, it could be he's fleeing the scene of a crime. He figures his life is over anyway, sees a crime of opportunity here, might as well take out some people, you know, uh, and uh, there, so there could be a combination of that kind of motive. Who, I don't know. But, um, the problem is that, let's just say, theoretically, hypothetically, that there is at least some element of motive here and that he was targeting these people as he really appears to be doing in the video. And that he was, um, he was spurred on in that direction by a lot of the misreporting and the false narratives in the media. Well, if that were the case, then we'd be relying on the media to tell us that it's their fault, partly, that this happened. I don't trust the media to tell me that. So we're in a position with this, uh, with this case that hey, we, we, we're probably going to be Las Vegas. We're never going to know the truth. Because whatever the media tells me about this, I, I can't believe it. I don't trust it. I do not trust what you're telling me, corporate media. You know, if, if, if the reality of this case is extremely inconvenient for you and your narrative. I don't believe that you will tell me. And then when they're insulting our intelligence early on by saying that potentially he was just fleeing the scene of a crime, give me a break. And of course we know that, you know, reverse the races here. If this was a white man plowing through a parade of mostly black people, um, the corporate media immediately, within like a second, Along with every elected Democrat, they would be saying, this is racially motivated. This is a hate crime. That's what they'd be saying. I'm not even saying that because I, I don't know. What I'm saying is that to me seems like at least a possibility. And the story they're telling us early on doesn't make sense to me and I don't believe it. Um, but there's another aspect of this case that we do that, that appears to be pretty well established. That this man, if he in fact was the guilty party... Um, career criminal out on bail. And so this is what, uh, this is what bail reform and justice reform gets us. Whether or not false media narratives are partly to blame, I suspect they might be, but we certainly know that bail reform, justice reform share some of the blame here because this man never should have been out of prison in the first place. Okay, there has to be a point where we as a, as a society can say, um, and this is what three strikes strike laws were supposed to be about. There has to be a point where we as a society can say to someone, okay, you've made it clear to us that you have no interest in living in society as a civilized human being. You've made it clear to us that you want to be, that you want to act like an animal. And so... That's how you're going to be treated. We're going to put you in a cage for the rest of your miserable life. There has to be a point where we can say that as a, as a society. The idea that we, we keep cycling these people through the system and putting them back on the street until they do something so heinous that, that even the most progressive DA would have to go for a life and sentence uh, 
a life in, in, in prison sentence, you know, that system, that strategy doesn't work. It results directly in these sorts of things. Because whether they say it or not, that is, you know, that's that's the strategy that these progressive DAs, many of them um, put in their position, partly through funding from George Soros and other um, other, uh, uh, you know, wealthy activists. But whether they say it explicitly or not, that's their strategy. That's their philosophy. That they're going to keep putting people back on the street, keep putting them back on the street, back on the street, and until they do something, until they at least kill someone. And even then, we, they still might end up back on the street. All right. Um, let's move on here. Kyle Rittenhouse was interviewed. In fact, he's, uh, he, he has an interview with Tucker Carlson. In fact, it came out that uh, Tucker Carlson has been filming a documentary about Kyle Rittenhouse throughout the trial. So that'll be very interesting to watch. But he's got an interview with uh, Kyle Rittenhouse that'll be released tonight, I believe, on Tucker's show. And there was a preview uh, of that interview that came out on Sunday. And he made, uh, Rittenhouse made a, a surprising comment that based on what I saw, the reaction on social media, even some people on the right are criticizing him for this. I think that's unfair, but let's listen to Kyle here. This has nothing to do with race. Um, it never had anything to do with race. It had to do with the right to self-defense. Right. Um, I'm not a racist person. I support the BLM movement. I support peacefully demonstrating. And I believe there needs to be change. I believe there's a lot of prosecutorial misconduct, not just in my case, but in other cases. Okay, so he says, I support the BLM movement. Now, um, like I said, I saw some criticism, uh, even on the right, towards Kyle Rittenhouse for that comment. Um, I, I don't blame the kid for this. I don't think it's fair at all to criticize him. He's worried for his own safety and his family's safety, number one. And also, remember something, that Democrats are pushing for a federal investigation. They have not let this go. And they're not going to let it go. They're going to pursue this, this, uh, this man, this young man, for the rest of his life. Um, but now they're pushing for a federal investigation. So I'm sure from Kyle Rittenhouse's perspective, and I'm sure he's also been told this by his lawyer. I don't know that, but I would assume that his lawyers maybe have said something like this. Um, that if he makes any comments publicly that could at all be construed as in any way critical of BLM, then that will open the door for them to you know, come after him officially. It shouldn't be that way, of course, but that's how it is. So I, you know, I, I wouldn't criticize him at all after everything he's been through to say that. Um, still, it does show what, what sort of stranglehold leftist grievous, grievance organizations like BLM have. That even Kyle Rittenhouse, after BLM, I mean, they, they are the ones who tried to lynch him. They, they are the lynch mob here. And even after going through all of that, he will still say, feels like he has to say, that he supports the very lynch mob that came after him. I say that not as a criticism of Kyle Rittenhouse, but more of the lynch mob itself, that, that, that this, is what, this is the society they've created. Uh, but I'll be interested to see the rest of that interview um, on Tucker Carlson's show tonight. Next, uh, Anthony Fauci now officially recommends boosters for everyone over the age of 18. And that will soon, of course, be everyone of all ages. But uh, here he is on CNN. Do you recommend that every single yeah. American, 18 and older, get a booster shot? Absolutely, Dana. Uh, let's make it clear. You know, when there's lack of clarity, people get confused. They're not sure what to do. If you are 18 or older and you've been vaccinated, fully vaccinated with the Moderna or the Pfizer mRNA six months or more ago, get a booster. If it's J&J and &J and it's two months ago or more, get a booster. I don't think we should get hung up on should, may. Just go out and get boosted. We know they're safe and we know they're highly effective in bringing very, very high up the optimization of your protection. So just go ahead and get boosted. Now's the time to do it. As we're getting into the holiday season, you want to be fully protected in the sense of getting optimal. I mean, the vaccines themselves clearly are still highly effective, but you want to make sure the durability of that protection is longer. And that's the reason why you get boosted, because we know no vaccine lasts forever. So the, the, the protection starts to wane a bit. And that's what the boost is all about. Protection starts to wane a bit. No vaccine lasts forever. 
Um, yeah, it's been six months. Six months. This is like your your waiter at the restaurant hands a bowl of spaghetti with a giant turd in it, and you complain, and he says, well, look, no meal is perfect. Six months? And his reasoning is, oh, it's not going to last forever. Now, they still won't come out and say what has been clear from the beginning, but they still won't say it because Anthony Fauci is allergic to the truth and also, like we talked about at the beginning, this is all part of their false reality. So they, they feel no obligation to the truth whatsoever. They've completely severed themselves from it. And they consider the truth itself to be the enemy, in fact. So that's why they've been lying the whole time. And they, and they still will not come out and say that, listen, this is endemic. It's going to be with us forever. You're always going to live in a world with COVID-19. You will never escape that. That's always going to be in the world. You'll, you'll probably get it at some point if you haven't already. Most of you have probably already had it, even if you didn't know you did. And if you haven't had it yet, you're going to get it eventually. I mean, every single person on earth, I think you know, we should just say this, if, it's, if, if, if this has not been made clear to you yet. No matter who you are listening right now, you, you will at some point get COVID-19. You'll, you will get it. Just like at some point, you, you're going to get the flu. You're probably not going to live your whole life and never get the flu. Um, it's endemic, and that's what it means when a virus, respiratory virus is endemic. But they still won't say that. They'll never say it. Ten years from now, they'll still be doing segments like that on CNN, and he still won't say, oh, listen, this is just, this is the way it is now. And, uh, you know, they could say, just like the flu, you know, there's, there's a different flu shot every year. If you want to be protected, you go out to get the flu shot or, or don't get it. It's up to you. They could say that with the COVID vaccine. You know, at, there's, there was always new mutations and everything. It's endemic. So, you're, you know, you're probably going to have to get it once a year or even more often if you want. But they, uh, they, they can't say that because the other thing is, if they say that, Kind of ironically, it it you know it makes people less afraid. In the long term, it makes you less afraid. To be to be told that well this is going to be here forever, then it just be, it becomes part of your reality and you start to get used to it. I mean, if they had said that a year ago, if they had been honest a year ago, and said this is endemic, we're always going to have it with us, get used to it, then by now I think a, a large number of people, a large majority of people, would be kind of used to it. And then you start thinking about masking and you would say, well, I mean, either I'm going to wear the mask forever or I'm going to stop wearing it now because it doesn't make any sense. I, you know, I, I, can, I can dispense with this fantasy that I'm going to wear the mask for a short period of time or a certain, you know, a certain temporary period of time and then stop wearing it. COVID is here forever. I can, I can wear the mask forever in response to that or I can live my life. And they could have given people a, a chance a year ago, a year and a half ago to make that, to, to think of it in those terms, come to terms with it and make their decisions. And if they had, then there are a lot of people right now who are not living normal human lives who might be, but they don't want that. They don't want you living a normal human life. They want you in the mask. They want you afraid forever. And uh, part of making it, that, that again is the irony of it. Part of making you afraid of COVID is to convince you that soon it will go away. If you, if you understand that it's here forever, you will actually be less afraid of it. All right. Um, next, what else we got? Quick, uh, okay, an update on this. I mentioned St. Louis University, um, SLU. You know, I'm supposed to speak there on December 1st. That's next, not this coming Wednesday, but next Wednesday. And um, there's a, a petition that started some of the leftist groups on, on campus. And I think this began with the um, SLU sluts. That's what they call themselves. That's not my term for them. They call themselves the sluts. And so the sluts and some other people on a SLU, they started a petition to keep me off of campus. And last I checked, in fact, I have it right here, they got 1,500, uh, 1,574 signatures on the campus to keep me off of campus on the basis that um, I am dangerous and that uh, you know I have a lot of, ex quote, extremely controversial and harmful opinions like feminism is the worst thing that ever happened to human society. And, um, you know, they say I'm, I'm very disrespectful to my opponents. I have called my opponents stupid and morally deranged. And, you know, in response to that, they have come up with this stupid and morally deranged petition as if to prove my point for me. And I appreciate that. So they got 1,500 uh, signatures. 
the Keep Matt Walsh off of St. Louis University campus. In response to that, I started the Keep Matt Walsh on St. Louis University campus. And our petition at this point has, um, we're at up to 18,000 signatures on that. And I'm, I'm not promoting it anymore. I mean, I promoted it once, you know, on, on Twitter. I sent it out there. And we doubled their signatures in 30 minutes. And now we're at 18,000. They're still stuck. So, you know, I think the people have spoken. This is democracy in action. Does that mean the university will respect the will of the people? Uh, I don't know. Or will they engage in an insurrection by usurping the will of the people and keeping me off of campus? I'm not sure about that. I will tell you that uh, the administrators on SLU, we're still working through this. You know, they're they're pulling all manner of dirty tricks right now, um, trying to get the event shut down or trying to convince me to shut it down. Um, so we're... we're fighting this behind the scenes as well. But one thing they're doing, and this is this is something that a lot of liberal campuses have, have uh, cued on to, is that, well, just keep keep putting in all these safe, quote-unquote safety measures because of COVID. Keep putting them in place until you convince the speaker to pull out because they don't want to be, they, they don't want to take part in, in the whole charade anymore. And so that's what the administrators are doing right now. Uh, they let the, the last I heard on Friday, they contacted the conservative group, college Republicans, who are bringing me on campus and um, they had a whole bevy of new safety precautions they wanted to put in place. And uh, interestingly enough, shockingly, there have been other events on campus in the last year where these safety precautions have not been put in place. But they want, but for me, they want them. So we're still working through that. And um, but I'll tell you one thing: as far as I'm concerned, no matter what, I am going to be on St. Louis University campus next Wednesday. No matter what, one way or another, I will be there. Um, all right, let's move now to the comment section. Daily cancellations are the law and order of the day. We the sweet baby gang. I got to keep learning this lesson with me. I am a, I am a s- stubborn, incorrigible bastard. And the more you tell me that you don't want me to do something, and the more you try to prevent me from doing it, the more I want to do it. Okay? It is... It, and a lot of that, I, I would like to pretend that this is all, you know, just principle and virtue on my part. It's not. A lot of it is just that I am a childish SOB. And when you tell me not to do something, I want to do it. But but that's that's how I am. So you're not going to keep me off. I will be there once again. Okay. This is uh, from Daniel says, I love Matt's move with the whole SLU scenario. It allows the sane, normally ignored majority to have its voice. Every other conservative speaker should take note. Thanks, Daniel. The Rose says, parents don't understand how teaching works. Quoting something we read on uh, Friday. Yes, this absolutely explains why homeschoolers routinely outperform institutionally educated children. Yeah, that's um, that's one of the dirty little secrets about homeschooling is that uh, academically, Homeschoolers often vastly outperform public schoolers, and uh, and that's that's true. I think among when it comes to socialization too, because that's another concern you always hear about public school uh, homeschool kids is that they're not properly socialized and they won't develop the right social skills. Well, that's a harder thing to measure than academic performance, but I think the proof is in the pudding here, and we can look at public school kids and the public school environment and the culture in the public school system. And you, you can take a look at that. And if you've spent any time in it, as I have, I spent 13 years in it from K through 12 <clears throat> when I went to public school. It's hard to argue that um, this is an environment that creates socially well-adjusted, mature people. It certainly doesn't. But academically, yeah, you're exactly right. And um, why is that? I mean, why would homeschool kids have an academic advantage over public school kids? One of the reasons is that, well, for one thing, in homeschool, most of the time, you're not wasting time on, you know, teaching kids critical race theory and gender theory and, you know, and, and tolerance and all that kind of diversity. We're not wasting any time on that. We're getting right down to the academics. But the other thing is that one of the most important resources you can have as a teacher is a connection with and knowledge of your students. Because education is a personalized thing. It's not something that you can successfully do in a con- conveyor belt, cookie cutter fashion. That's what they're trying to do in the public school system. They've been trying to do it for decades. It doesn't work. Um, education is personalized. 
And as a parent, you know your kid better than anybody else. You have a connection with your child, hopefully, that their public school teacher doesn't have and couldn't have, in fairness to the public school teacher. I mean, they've got 30 kids in a room for 45 minutes at a time. They can't develop personal connection with, uh, with all of those kids. You do have that as a parent, and that means that you understand what your kid needs academically and how to reach them and um, you know, how to keep them engaged. And that's a great, that's a great advantage that homeschool teachers have. Um, SEE says, BYU has similar problems where LGBTQ and like-minded groups are fighting for more representation, but the lifestyle is not in line with LDS teachings. These religious private institutions are meant to promote higher learning and be separate from the world's views. They focus not only on logic, but on moral truth. Uh, the hope is that you graduate with more knowledge of the world and come out a more spiritually enlightened person. Uh, they'd be crazy not to let you speak. By the way, I'd argue that first wave feminist ideas, voting rights, education, the ability to choose a specific job or career is fine. It's what came after that poisoned everything and turned feminism into a bad word. Well, I agree with the first part of what you said, not the second part. Um, as I as I've been explaining, you know, feminism. You, you could go go back to the founders of feminism and read what they had to say about religion, Christianity, the Bible, the family, marriage, men. Feminism from the very beginning has been an anti-family, anti-male, anti-religious phenomenon. There have been exceptions from the beginning, but those exceptions have always been exceptions. And that shouldn't really surprise us because. When this idea that like first wave feminism in the early 20th century, it was pure and right and good. And then within a few decades, it's it's arguing for the mass slaughter of babies. I mean, if your movement goes from one thing to within a few years, arguing for the mass slaughter of babies, th- that's a pretty good indication that something was wrong from the beginning. I mean, there is something foundationally wrong with with your movement. Now, we know that the saying about, about all movements is that uh, eventually they become, you know, a business and a racket. And, 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 and maybe that's true. But if the business of your movement, again, with only, within only a few years or decades, is to kill babies, then that tells you that there's something wrong at its root. I mean, feminism is sick at its root. It may have had a few goals early on that were commendable. Um, but that doesn't change the fact that it's poisoned at its roots. And now a word from one of my favorite sponsors, American Financing. If it feels like everything costs more these days, including the cost to borrow money, well, uh, that's because it is. Everything is more expensive. Uh, well, at least for some things like credit cards and personal loans. But mor- mortgages still have incredibly low rates, which means you should really be looking at your home loan and all of your debt, for that matter, and figuring out ways to save money uh, because you got money, you know, if we all do. With all the bills we pay every month, just money leaking out of your accounts. You can put a pin in some of that now, uh, and uh, that's what you need American Financing for. This is a family-owned lender that's known for saving people up to $1,000 a month from lower interest rates to more competitive terms or even the ability to access cash. They can do all of that and much more. And you don't have to reset your loan to get these kinds of savings. You can choose any term, 10 years and over, because you shouldn't pay interest for for years that you don't need. So to pre-qualify for free, Call 1-866-569-4711. That's 866-569-4711. Or visit AmericanFinancing.net. You know, if you've been worrying about uh, what you're going to get your loved ones this Christmas, then I have excellent news for you. The Daily Wire merch store is here and ready to be explored. Yes, you heard that right. Daily Wire merch is finally here. People ask me, actually do ask me this a lot. Like, why don't we have merchandise? Well, we finally do. And we have it just in time for the holidays. So um, I know for me, that's my whole family. All they're getting is Daily Wire merchandise especially because it's free for me. So I'm not going to spend a dime and I'm going to give everybody my own merchandise. And that's the kind of gift quality that they expect from me. Head to dailywire.com slash shop to check out the collection of Let's Go Brandon tailgate gear, our poster collection of the Founding Fathers Drinking Leftist Tears, and so, so much more. Anyone can shop at the Daily Wire store, but only Daily Wire members will get special discounts up to 20% off. Members also receive access to shop exclusive merch like the Daily Wire Leftist Tears Tumblr, which holds more leftist tears than the average man knows what to do with. And of course, I have my section on the shop as well. And if you're wondering, can you get the Sweet Baby Gang shirts there? You absolutely can. So head to the dailywire.com slash shop to get a, a little something for everyone on your list who loves Brandon or as a member of the Sweet Baby Gang, even if they're not a member of the Sweet Baby Gang, still get them Sweet Baby Gang shirt. That's their gift for Christmas. You're inducting them into the gang, and they will love it. Trust me. And if you sign up uh, right now, become a member at dailywire.com slash subscribe. You can get 35% off your membership 
And use uh, if you want to do that, use code DW35. Now let's get to our daily cancellation. So today we cancel the Fight for 15 movement, though this may be redundant because it has mostly canceled itself. For several years, we were told that $15 an hour is the be-all and end-all. If only every worker in America could be paid at least $15 an hour, then there would be no more poverty, no more hunger, no more climate change. I'm not totally sure about that last one. I meant that last one as kind of a joke, but I'm sure if I Googled it, I would discover that at least one member of the squad has made an argument at some point that a minimum wage of less than $15 an hour causes climate change. I'm just assuming that someone has said that. Or maybe not merely less than 15, because after years of clamoring for 15, fighting for 15, over the last year, we've seen many headlines like this in Teen Vogue, $15 uh, minimum wage isn't enough for workers to afford rent in any U.S. state. And this in Yahoo, $15 an hour isn't enough. U.S. workers need a living wage. Fight for 15. Never mind, that's not enough. This is, of course, the unbroken pattern with all progressive causes. Set a goal, make it the ultimate objective, the final summit to be climbed. And then as soon as you get there to your destination, promptly declare that it's paltry and insignificant and we must set course for some farther destination Anybody who thinks that you should be satisfied with where you currently are is a monster, a bigot, a racist, a Nazi, and worst of all, somehow also probably a transphobe. This is the flight path for all forms of leftist activism. And now we know the next stop. It will only be a a brief layover, we can be sure, but a a viral post on Twitter has been making the rounds, posted originally by a self-described trans-indigenous journalist with they-them pronouns. It proclaims that the new slogan is this, 25 or walk. Potential job applicants are called to engage in a McDonald's employment boycott. What this means is that they must refuse to work at McDonald's. They must work anywhere but McDonald's until the fast food chain will pay a thriving wage of $25 an hour. I mean, who needs a living wage anymore? Let's go for a thriving wage. It also calls for a disruption of McDonald's hiring resources. You're encouraged to apply for a job, schedule the interview, and then either either never show for the interview or accept the job, but don't show up to work. The idea is to focus the energy on one company, bully them into raising their wage to 25 an hour, and then wait for the other dominoes to fall. There are some problems with this idea, and they're mostly the same problems with the Fight for 15 movement. Um, and, uh, you know, when it comes, and then it'll be the same problems when it becomes the Fight for 35 movement and the Fight for 55 and the fight for, Fight for $600 an hour. These same problems will still persist. So let's go through a few of them very quickly. And this is far from an exhaustive list, but here it goes. First, you're not going to bully McDonald's into paying you $25 an hour. You will, however, bully them into replacing you with automated touchscreens, as they've already been done doing in locations all all over the world. Now, I am personally not a fan of this trend. I would prefer to see actual human beings working these jobs. I also don't like having to touch the same screen that 500 greasy-fingered people before me touched. And the catch-22, as always, is that none of the human workers in the building have the skill or knowledge required to fix the automated systems when they malfunction. Humans are replaced by technology that they don't know how to operate or fix. We're literally two steps away from Terminator at this point. All that to say, I take no satisfaction in seeing positions eliminated as robots are substituted for human workers. But this is what is happening and will continue to happen. And the more you fight to make low-skilled jobs as expensive as possible for employers, the more you guarantee that those jobs won't exist in the future. Second, I really hate the snobby elitist attitude that many people have towards blue-collar jobs. You know, a lot of kids pick this, pick this up back in grade school when they're told by their teachers and guidance counselors that if they don't go to college and get the kind of job that requires a college degree, they're going to be miserable failures in life. If they take this propaganda at face value and they go to college, even if they graduate and end up unemployed and living at their parents' house, still they feel entitled to turn their noses up at people who work for a living and oftentimes make a lot more money than they do, which isn't hard if they're unemployed. There are many, and I mean hundreds and hundreds of jobs, so-called blue-collar jobs that don't require college education and yet, and yet do require specialized skill. And you can make a very respectable living in them while also providing necessary goods and services to the public. Mechanics, plumbers, electricians, just a few examples. These are jobs where you should be able to, and certainly can, earn both a living wage and a thriving wage. Not because the government mandates it, but because you earn it. But running a cash register at a fast food chain is not one of those kinds of jobs. Entry-level fast food jobs are very, very low-skilled. 
Being a mechanic is not low skilled. Running a cash register at a fast food joint is. It's so low skilled that a 12 year old could do it, if not for child labor laws. There's a reason the positions can so easily be replaced by touch screens. I mean, you're doing a job that the customer can do themselves. This, this weekend, we needed a new water heater at our house. And some, some guys came this weekend to, uh, to install it. I can't do that myself. I needed someone with their skills to do it. I can, however, punch my own order into the screen at McDonald's. I can even bag my own food if we want to do it buffet style. It's a job that requires no specialized skill of any kind. All workers in all fields at all jobs are technically replaceable. One of the reasons, as I always say, that you should find meaning in your family more than you do at work. But the difference is that an entry-level fast food worker is very, very easily replaced. Because literally almost anybody on earth can do that job. Now, I don't say this as an insult to people who work those jobs. I worked them too when I was a teenager. That's because those kinds of jobs, along with the minimum wage itself, are made for teenagers. They're not intended to be a career. You're not supposed to be trying to live off them. $25 an hour? That's what mechanics and technicians and athletic trainers and sheet metal workers make. Those are jobs, again, that require training and skill. They couldn't just pull anybody off the street, give them a name tag and a 30-minute orientation, and expect them to do it. But that is the case with entry-level fast food. And I keep stressing entry-level because there are jobs in the food industry which do require a great amount of skill and do pay a living wage or even a thriving wage and should. Salting the fries or punching an order into the cash register aren't among those jobs, which is why you shouldn't try to make yourself comfortable or satisfied with those jobs. And that brings us to the third point. The focus on minimum wage is, is depressing. It's a kind of despair. You know, let's make sure people can live on the minimum. Why the minimum? I mean, what sort of mantra is that? What, what sort of mission is that? It's the mission of people who want us all to be fed and satiated, but not fulfilled. Despite what the Twitter post said, they don't want us to thrive. There's a reason they want us all living in pods and eating bugs. If the goal is to thrive, and that should indeed be the goal, then pressing buttons and wearing a visor and a name tag ought to be treated as a very temporary stepping stone, not a career option, not a lifestyle choice. I mean, even if we could flip a magic switch and ensure that you can live off of, even financially thrive off of, entry-level fast food jobs, you still wouldn't really be thriving because you'd still be doing a mostly mindless job that requires no skill. It's a job that you can't really put any of yourself into. You're still a very replaceable cog in a dehumanizing machine. Nobody should be satisfied with that. So let's stop worrying about the minimum and worry about moving past that. Which again, anyone can do. That's the good news. If you're, if you're stuck at a minimum wage job at a fast food place and you want to move up to the next, uh, the next step and move beyond that, all you got to do, tuck your shirt in, show up to work on time, be reliable, be at least moderately cheerful with the customers. That's the hardest part of the job. Believe me, I know. Do that for six months and you're already going to get a promotion because the bar is so low. And that should be the goal, not the minimum wage, which is why today the, minimum, the, the entire minimum wage, in fact, I think is canceled. And we'll leave it there for today. Thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. Have a great day. Godspeed. The Matt Walsh Show is produced by Sean Hampton, executive producer Jeremy Boring. Our supervising producer is Mathis Glover. Our technical director is Austin Stevens. Production manager, Pavel Vodosky. The show is edited by Ali Hinkle. Our audio is mixed by Mike Coromina. Hair and makeup is done by Cherokee Hart. And our production coordinator is McKenna Waters. The Matt Walsh Show is a Daily Wire production. Copyright Daily Wire 2021. John Bickley here, Daily Wire editor-in-chief. Wake up every morning with our new show, Morning Wire. On today's episode, the Rittenhouse verdict sparks both protests and support, concerns grow over the safety of a Chinese tennis star, and Thanksgiving costs climb. Join us and get the facts first on the news you need to know with our show, Morning Wire.